everyone. My name is Ani Febriastati. I'm the Associate Director um, of, of Economic Executive Education Singapore Futures here at uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, delighted to welcome everyone to the seventh episode of the Futures Forward webinar. Uh, the, um, the webinars that, you know, we focus on uh, the various features conversation. Uh, very delighted to have a uh, stellar panelists as well as moderator today. Uh, but as we are waiting for more participants to stream in, I'm, I'm hoping if, you know, uh, the audience who has joined, you could probably uh, uh, do a quick hello and share with us, uh, you know, where you are dialing from or, you know, where you are from in the chat function. Hello, Amber. Hello, Marjorie. Hi, Fukun. Hi, Leticia. Oh, wow. We have a uh, very diverse participants. We see Philippines, South Africa, Singapore, from Japan. Oh, we, we do have uh, Lucas from Vienna. And it's always, uh, you know, very delighted to have uh, our students uh, webinar. <clears throat> All right, I think, uh, shall we get these slides on? Okay, so today we will be, um, you know, um, discussing on the topic of future of geopolitics and Really happy to welcome our friends, uh, Mr. Duncan Silo, Senior Program Manager, International Affairs at the Frederick Ebert Stiftung FES um, Office for Regional Cooperation in Asia, who will be moderating uh, today's conversation. And of course, you know, we are so honored to have two stellar panelists joining us. Uh, we have Ambassador Marilyn Ala Aralira, Senior Fellow from the Philippine Public Safety College. Hi, Ambassador Marilyn, welcome to have you back okay. at our event. And of course, uh, we have Dr. Mendy uh, Jargal Saikhan, uh, Deputy Director and Dean of the Institute for Strategic Studies in Mongolia. Hi, Dr. Mendy, really pleasure to have you here. Well, thank um, you very much. Without further ado, I shall hand over the time to Dan Kim, who will be moderating our insightful conversation today around the uh, future geopolitics. Over to you, Dan Kim. Thank you very much, Hani, and it's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this uh, series, uh, Future Forwards webinar series, and in this particular one, looking at the future of geopolitics. Now, this is an extremely large topic, and in the day we live in now, I think everything is geopolitics now, <laughs> left, right, and center. And everyone is asking, you know, uh, <clears throat> when did geopolitics suddenly become left, right, and center in a blink of an eye? and things are changing very rapidly. Tomorrow, uh, what is uh, true of today uh, is already yesterday's news uh, by, uh, you know, when tomorrow comes. So uh, in this particular context, there are, uh, I think the, these, these two topics, futures and the, the, the futures forward um, methodology and this frame of mind and geopolitics, I think uh, finding a common ground between them becomes important so that in such a fast changing world uh, with, with geopolitics having many dimensions, a pervasive impact, and um, the challenges here to stay for a while. Uh, the future's frame of mind gives us that little bit of gap uh, to allow us to understand, to reflect, as well as uh, to anticipate uh, and 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 uh, you know we, with the view that you know we we, we better, better understand we better uh, the the larger impact the longer term impact uh, with a view ultimately to also be able to think in this very rapidly changing world um, 
what might the solutions be? What might, uh, how, how might we approach these current challenges? Um, history has shown that uh, this is not entirely the first time that we have been in such a situation. And uh, at times it has, <clears throat> there has been turbulence, but at times uh, the world has also prevailed, uh, you know, with peace. So, um, that is the broader background of this of, of what I really understand this 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 merging between the futures idea that we are looking at uh, today and geopolitics uh, subject. When we say geopolitics, of course, I will leave it to the panelists to define their sphere of geopolitics. We have very two uh, two distinguished as well as uh, from diverse background <clears throat> speakers who I'll introduce uh, very shortly. And, um, and, and, you know, given that it is everywhere, everything, uh, the geopolitics of one country, one region, not being inextricably uh, possible to de-link, de decouple, unlink, it's gonna be a difficult task also for the panelists to explain in full, you know, what, 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 uh, the geo a few of what the future holds in terms of geopolitics, but, I will uh, leave it to them. I also hope that uh, this, this session is an interactive one. Um, and, uh, you know, both a few, any future and the current geopolitical realm and domain that we are entering into is one which is multifaceted, which benefits from uh, diverse discussions, perspectives, uh, dialogue, bringing together of, uh, of good questions as much as good answers. Uh, and so I hope it is uh, 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 an interactive one. And so I invite all participants to generously also uh, contribute uh, in the form of questions, comments, and, 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 and other remarks uh, once we have had uh, our speakers uh, make their remarks. Before, for, uh, we, without further ado, uh, I, I take great, uh, great privilege and an honor to be able to introduce uh, the first speaker, Ambassador Marilyn Alarilla. She's senior fellow at the Philippines Public Safety College and a guest lecturer uh, for, uh, for, for the Diplomacy International Affairs Program at the Lascelles College uh, in the Philippines. In her last posting as, uh, in the Diplomatic Corps, Ambassador Alarila was her country's ambassador to Turkey with concurrent uh, jurisdiction over Georgia and Azerbaijan. And prior to that, uh, to Laos. So we have here with us uh, one who has uh, latterly spent time in academia, uh, in deep thinking uh, with uh, allowing reflection, but also very much in the heart of it. Uh, and as you, as you can see, over posting very different uh, di different geographical domains. Um, I, I, I invite Ambassador Alerila to give your remarks, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dean Kim. And good afternoon, uh, Dr. Mendy and Dr. Annie. So uh, our topic today is certainly uh, of utmost importance considering the simultaneous developments and transformations happening in various areas. And then the scope of geopolitics is also getting expansive as there are different terrains and means uh, to reach goals of actors involved. So in addition to the traditional sectors where we have the political, military, security, or economic sectors, we also now have environment, health, social, ideological, or technological sectors which transcends physical boundaries, all right? Uh, also, we have cyberspace and outer space as the terrains also of geopolitics, okay? And the hybrid warfare is also um, increasingly being practiced. Now, for the major geopolitical risk, of course, the first will be the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where we can see consequences on energy security. So we have the uh, rising energy costs, uh, also rising transportation costs. Then we also have food security, particularly for those in North Africa and the Middle East who are getting their food supplies from Ukraine. No? Uh, this is uh, supplying them with 
cereal, wheat, and barley. And then, of course, we have the supply chain disruption. So previously, uh, companies were using just-in-time inventory and production. Now, it's no longer efficiency or cost. It's the security of the supply. Do you have the material? And then, of course, that also raised the uh, transaction cost. Second is the COVID, COVID pandemic. So it's exacerbated by the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. But we see here the aggravation of divisions between countries, particularly in the accessibility of the vaccines during the early period. So less developed countries have only 22% of the population vaccinated. And we also see a like a gap in the international cooperation for accessibility. Let's say we have what we call vaccine nationalism initially, uh, restricting the access, no? And uh, also the lack of transparency on data on the incidents and the death. Then, of course, we have climate change and other environmental concerns. We have several countries that will disappear, like Kiribati, Maldives, and other areas. And um, the global warming, rising of sea level, also affecting the livelihood and health of many people. Now, going to Asia Pacific, so we have several plus points in our region. Just recently, uh, during a summit in Cambodia, United States, South Korea, and Japan condemned North Korea's missile test. And the U.S. committed to defend South Korea and Japan. Four days after, North Korea launched a short-range ballistic missile. And that was only six days ago. And so now, uh, what is the what? Uh, will we still pursue the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula? Or will there be like an arms race with countries like Japan, South Korea, or Taiwan now build up their uh, nuclear, uh, build up nuclear uh, capabilities uh, to match up with North Korea? All right, and then of course we have Taiwan. Uh, the foreign minister of Taiwan said that um, China's strategy for the invasion of Taiwan is very dangerous, and that they were conducting missile tests, airspace exercises, cyber attacks, disinformation campaign, and uh, Taiwan had to raise its budget. Then of course we have the uh, Sentaku Island dispute uh, between uh, Japan and China. Uh, and uh, you know very well the South China Sea issue where we have seven claimants and uh, for China uh, they recognize it as essential for their maritime security and also to fend off uh, encirclement by the US so we're aware of the first island strategy South China Sea is in the first island chain strategy. Then the second island chain strategy, uh, Benham Rise of the Philippines is there in the second island chain strategy. And so uh, China has been uh, building island, militarizing, uh, instituting aircraft missiles on those islands. Um, meanwhile, we also have like AUKUS and Quad. So the Australia, UK, US cooperation with the intent of setting up uh, in uh, Australia a local industrial base for the construction and maintenance of nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, and incidentally, Australia had to renege its agreement with France you know, at that time. And so aside from that, uh, which aims to uh, preserve uh, security and stability in, in the Pacific. So we also have the quad of the uh, right Australia, India, Japan, and US. Uh, and they just met last May in Tokyo and discussed the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness, among other things. No? And both the quad and the AUKUS is seen as a response to the rise of China and a possible China centered Asia Pacific. All right. And then, of course, we have uh, the earlier uh, 
US-China uh, rivalry. So we have the trade war, we have the tech war. Uh, and uh, so it also have consequences on some factories or companies leaving uh, China and moving out to other uh, countries. Um, so these are, uh, for the South China Sea, of course, uh, we have the uh, intrusions or aggressions uh, in the South China Sea, although uh, the ruling of the arbitral uh, panel is supposed to be uh, binding and legal, and we're supposed to uh, abide by it. So, uh, what should be the uh, uh, way forward? For me, what I think is important is to address the rising inequalities. Uh, even if it's, let's say, in the SDG goal, Sustainable Development Goal number 10, is to reduce uh, inequalities between and within countries. It's not uh, being attained. It's being slowed down because of the COVID and because of all this happening. But uh, what will happen to the countries being left behind? And it has repercussion internationally uh, if these countries uh, remain okay, behind. And then, of course, uh, how do we uh, stand the rise of authoritarianism? Uh, there is a declining uh, uh, freedom index uh, in almost many countries. So that's another uh, challenge for us. And how do we strengthen uh, rule-based international order? So that's for me uh, the most important concerns with respect to uh, future uh, geopolitics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Well, you have, you, have, you have managed to very succinctly put, you know, a very broad topic into very neatly, <clears throat> neat spaces, defining some of the very key global uh, uh, issues. Uh, the key issues that impact Asia, but uh, very much also uh, the world. And this is really showing how intertwined uh, the world we live in, where nothing is inextric inextricable now. You also define some of the drivers of change as well as uh, offering some of the key, uh, you know, key, key, key points that we need to look at in terms of solutions. And I think I think that's a topic which I'll come back to do a little bit uh, on uh, to, 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 to unpack a little bit more on the solutions uh, that you offer. Uh, but before that, now let me turn to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Mendi Jargal Saikhan from Mongolia. Uh, also a country which is in the midst of intense uh, geopolitical contestations. Uh, in this case, not only uh, of two, two powers, but in this case, uh, one will, which, which, is, which also had a third, third neighbor, right? Um, so also very uniquely uh, in, in, in a geopolitical strategic location. Uh, Dr. Jalgar Saikhan is Deputy Director and Dean at the Institute for Strategic uh, studies of Mongolia, and he, uh, the, he, his, his research interests and work are around the Belt and Road Initiative, international security, geopolitical peacekeeping, and the impacts of the uh, ex extractive industry and security politics and, and, and uh, economy of Central and Inner Asia. <clears throat> the institute that uh, Dr. Jalgar Saikhan sits, um, sits at the sits at the office of the presidency of Mongolia. Uh, and so this is also uh, seeped between policy, but also uh, but, but also research, and he's able to offer a lot. I'm also very grateful that he's uh, joining us today all the way uh, from Vancouver, where it is past midnight. Thank you very much for joining us, Mendy. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dinkum, and also I'm very pleased and honored joining uh, Ambassador Marilyn on this panel. And so this is, it was uh, very interesting when you were asked to talk about geopolitics. So I can see like in my like late teenagers, like in 1980, Mongolia is caught up between a double war, double Cold War, a Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States and the China and Russia. China and Soviet Union. What we th thought about was like it's a there will be war next day, and we're thinking about the weapons of mass destruction. And in that scenario, we all like as a teenager, like about that, I was a senior high school, just thinking about maybe joining the military and then live with my fear, 
and we will all kind of expect in the world happening on the next day. And then in 1990, so when it's just started against university years, the, the, the social system is collapsed. And you just imagine like a, all the function system will collapse one day. And on the next day, you will worry about the electricity. You worry about the heat in the winter and you worry about the water, not only the hot water, but the cold water. And then your mom will be scared like if the electricity will be cut off before the, rook is co- the rice is cooked. And that was a kind of time like the, when the, the function system or, or that's like another thing like we kind of experience it. And we're all worried about the blackouts when you're in the lift or when you're driving. So it's, uh, it's hard. And then in 2000s, we seen this mining boom. Like people start calling Mongolia, say Mongolia, and all the foreign investors thinking about there will be like a very strong investment in Chinese market is hungry about the commodity, and you can make money there because you can build the infrastructure, you can uh, ship the commodity, and so that's like a kind of area like we think about all Mongolia will be connected and then it'll be great, and then starting from 2014 we will see something different. Russia take over Crimea. And suddenly like in the late, like 2019 and 2020, we hit by the pandemic and then a war and both of the airports in Moscow and Beijing closed. And all the landlines, roads, rails, and uh, ports are not functioning. It's closed. So we were, we're kind of kind of country closed. And then one goal is getting out through the world, through the with, as we call the third neighbors with the developed countries. So we were flying out through Seoul, Tokyo, and Frankfurt, and Istanbul. And we still know like a Beijing airport is still closed and no airlines are flying through Moscow. And the one thing like I was really like it kind of happened, really glad at this moment is the, this uh, virtual connectivity. And this... Uh, so this is got really kind of one of the thing like uh, even during the pandemic it helped us stay home and also help us like, uh, stay connected even now like it's I'm in Vancouver and in debating or participating in this talk about the Japan. So it's really interesting team and I think like there's a more we can talk and learn about the geopolitics. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, one thing which which has come out very uh, already quite strongly is that in, in not, not only are the world interlinked, the issues are interlinked, that when we are talking of high geopolitics, uh, the issues of the people also matter. And that uh, you cannot solve, uh, solve, solve global geopolitics if you're not putting to the front issues also of, of, of justice, of equity, and so on and so forth, right? And, and, and I think that's that's one which I also importantly pick, picked up very quickly. Well, thank you very much, uh, um, Mendy, for, 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 for that wonderful uh, time trial, time trail, uh, which, which will help us also to see, you know, how things change and, and, and between what you anticipate and what eventually happens. Uh, very often differ, but also uh, yet at the same time a need to 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 somehow anticipate what some of these uh, these these things can be. Uh, before uh, before I've already started seeing some a uh, couple of good questions. In fact, uh, for for our discussion before that, maybe I take the chair's uh, prerogative to ask both of you to see uh, maybe uh, in the next, not like given that we have so much happening here, uh, let's take maybe a, 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 a maybe a 10 year or 15, 20, 15 year timeline uh, down the road. Is what, what you see as important drivers of change? Uh, maybe maybe one, one, from each, one from each of you. What what would be an important driver of change, and wh- what do you see, uh, you know, would 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 continue to impact uh, and change geopolitics? Okay, I can look okay, at do the two things. One is uh, obviously the politics of the great powers. So whether what's happening inside China or Russia or the United States. So these 
this will be still like a matters in our life and it will change the the how we act in the world but the, another thing that really interesting is i mean the technology hmm. it will be another major drive whether good or bad it's uh, questionable right? or we can uh, debate but technology will be another will remain the key driver of the change thank you okay, so for me after me it's also technology uh, because uh, there are so many disruptions uh, from the technological development and this happens in all sectors like it's not only education it's business it's health and then even what we call let's say hybrid warfare quick generation warfare uh cyberspace so um and uh the big companies major transnational companies are all based on technology so uh it's really a major source of change and uh so we have to look uh which countries are like dedicating a uh, percentage uh, on uh, research and development and is the private sector now ahead of the government with respect to science uh, so those are the questions and what is the objective or the goal is it only for dominance or for profit can we use technology to improve the human condition uh, the data to let's say predict uh, disasters and so on no so how can we make it shift to the area where it can contribute to the human well-being okay. absolutely and of course um, i come just coming out of cop 27 now climate is mm -hmm. also left right and center uh, between technology and everything else and that's another thing which uh, which which many others also predict to uh, remain important um, in that well, now let, let, let me take a couple of questions that we already have from here, and I do invite now um, the, the, the participants who have joined us from all over uh, to, to please um, post questions or remarks so that I can share it uh, with both panelists. The first one we have uh, is one on China. Okay. Uh, China's people diplomacy that covers its espionage and espionage efforts. Has there been any incidents or cases that can be discussed publicly? Uh, Besir, do I understand correctly that what you <clears throat> want to un understand is a little bit more to do with tactics? Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Maybe this is a little bit a very specific question, which we could also try and uh, address. Uh, maybe there's a technology dimension to that. I think uh, from from what I understand is um, it poses China's people diplomacy covers espionage and espionage efforts. So this is to do with uh, also the online uh, campaigns and the information, misinformation, disinformation. Uh, okay, tech works. Okay, yeah, so so that's exactly. So in a way, one way we, we could reframe is coming back to technology is, uh, yes, in this particular case, uh, China, but maybe we could frame it more broadly, is how good technology, uh, you know, impact uh, this tension from the perspective of information, disinformation, the campaigns that we are seeing, uh, maybe offer some thoughts on that. Yes, okay, so I may answer. Uh, it's the weaponization of social media has been a major concern. So it's uh, there are several countries that are weaponizing social media to further splinter societies. Uh, so there can be through disinformation or uh, yes, the fake news and so on, and targeting um, the weaknesses. Or we also have seen the interference in elections, uh, several countries, the elections in several countries to uh, spreading of this news. Uh, so we are uh, looking at like let's say during the health pandemic, so there were the issues uh, 
training, let's say, anti-vaxxers and then the pro-vaxxers. And in the process, it weakens the health system of the country involved. So they'd like winning uh, their, I think their goal without firing a bullet, but just using misinformation and disinformation. And uh, this is also being done in other aspects uh, to weaken the uh, fabric, social fabric of uh, several societies. Okay, then that's my take on it. Thank you. It's a, uh, I think it's a, it's a tough question. So Mongo is because of location, it's like a very classic novel of the great game. So it's like, a, we never do all and both are trying to like a learn and it's a, it's a classic location. We all can make a rumors about it, but it's a hard to, uh, hard to substantiate it. But I would say, yeah, obviously like they're, they each, all of them, like the countries are studying each other, whether like at that very sophisticated Spanish uh, uh, purposes, but, and there there's lots of rumors that whether like uh, the China is trying to use the like IT technology or social media trying to influence the domestic politics. And then Sabe has already been uh, talking about the, the Russian involvements like in, in other elections, but I couldn't deny it. And also at the same time, I couldn't approve it because it's uh, otherwise it's uh, the neighbors can um, resolve like a mistrust between the Mongols and China because we've been our that uh, hostile tension have been like uh, just thirty years ago so we still like I have this remaining anti Chinese sentiments and kind of suspicions about the China and then it could be a like, uh, link it up with the global uh, type of campaign whether it's uh, intentionally or it's happening so I. Don't know any like uh, there is uh, one or two cases. Always, it's not only connected to China with India and also the, with the other countries. So these cases have been like, tried by the by the courts, but I don't uh, have like uh, the clear evidence saying okay, yes, this is happening in Mongolia. All right. So if I may add, uh, perhaps uh, we have seen other countries as well on how to prevent or fight misinformation or disinformation. So we have the example of Finland, when uh, the school children are being taught how to uh, investigate whether what they're reading is fake or not, and not just accept what everything is being fed to you. No? So the students, uh, in form of their class exercises, will investigate the validity. Uh, at the time, the context was the EU election, whether the issues being uh, separated are valid or not, and like elementary or high school uh, students uh, do the research so that they um, like imbibe it and build it as a habit to not just be read, but investigate uh, whatever is being read or being spread. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, this comes in the midst of this argument that there is the technological juggernaut, you know, which <clears throat> is a little bit on a path dependent course, not quite something you put back into the genie on the one hand, uh, but at the same time, there's the argument that some will uh, <clears throat> make that the technology itself is, uh, is values agnostic or uh, entirely agnostic of issues, but uh, evidence has shown that sometimes um, you know, it reflects a little bit of our own um, our own tendencies, uh, which very often can be detrimental to societies. And uh, I think this raises the important question then of if you cannot fully control it, how do you govern it and regulate it? Uh, which comes to the next question, maybe a good segue uh, from Vincenzo. Uh, on the role of multilateralism. Uh, maybe we can also put issues of multilateral of governance of these type of global issues uh, in addressing geopolitical tensions. <clears throat> and relatedly, the role of multilateral institutions such as the UN, ASEAN, EU, uh, their relevance in, uh, in, in ad addressing these continuing geo geopolitical tensions. Who would like to go first? Just, yeah, I, I think this is a, a kind of very important thing when uh, when there is a tension 
emerges like a, the all the great powers start kind of struggling and then this is the time to invest and strengthen the multilateral institutions because this is the avenue you need to talk about the rules that would govern and also you can like bring the challenges and bring uh, bring the challenges and trying to like uh, seek the ways to implement how to implement these new challenges new rules so I would assume like the importance at the moment like we see that you all the all the multilateral so people kind of like saying come up all the multilateral institutions have been like a week and they have no role in this game however this is probably the best time for especially the smaller and uh, middle powers or they need to invest and strengthen their multilateral institutions and then otherwise it's uh, it'll be hard so i i think like there is a very strong urge and need for the multilateralism given this time. Yes, I agree uh, with Dr. Mandy. There is now all the more a need for our uh, multilateral institutions. No? And at the same time, we have the rise of what we call nationalism uh, when some countries revert to, uh, let's say, isolationism or protectionism. Um, and uh, we also see, let's say, the trend to what we call mini lateralism. Let's say uh, a few countries, uh, like-minded, will cooperate on special issues. However, uh, if we don't have the uh, multilateral institutions, uh, definitely we will find a need to set it up because we have so much uh, multilateral issues uh, that transcends borders that one country cannot solve it. Uh, you cannot solve it without cooperating with others. You cannot stop the spread of, let's say, the what, information, pandemic, health crisis, humanitarian crisis. So that's why, all the more, we need um, the uh, in, improved role of the multilateral institutions. However, the question also is, uh, do we have to like reform or how do you improve uh, the performance of some of the inter uh, segments of our international institutions because some of them are also being criticized. So we have the example of the WHO with this initial response of the COVID. So there were much criticism as well because of the uh, transparency of the, let's say, um, background and then the data and so on. And then also now, like UN Security Council is also uh, so much criticized and also the effectivity of the UN, let's say in peacekeeping operations. So we also have challenges, but at the same time, uh, we have these institutions already. So uh, we look at ways on how to strengthen and can they adjust or be modified according to the changing uh, conditions that we have now, all right? Now there's a question on, is ASEAN or EU still relevant? Uh, for example, for ASEAN, uh, well, certainly it's still relevant, but uh, it's being tested. The relevance is being tested. Especially, for example, uh, we have the concern in Myanmar, no? So that's a very serious concern for us in ASEAN. And our response or how do we address the situation is really a test for us. Anyway, but, uh, so there are still so many areas where uh, regional and multilateral cooperation uh, can still contribute, particularly in the situation where we are now. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. I think uh, maybe just to expand a little bit on that is uh, another way of framing, which um, which I know is often on top of everyone's mind is uh, we, we see multilateralism, but we also see these days the rise of this minilateralism and uh, forming of friends. So are these consistent and are they, uh, what should be prioritized in this world where, uh, you know, where, where there is limited bandwidth uh, with everyone? And you also already mentioned a little bit about uh, <clears throat> the UN reforms. Yes, there is a uh, felt a need and agreement that the global order, the system that was put in place uh, after the Second World War has served its purpose. It's not entirely reflecting uh, the realities of today. And therefore, 
uh, one argument on that perspective where there is a need to change. Some countries who feel that, uh, you know, they must also sit at the high table, they take responsibility without uh, having the chair. And then there is the second aspect where uh, this system has not fully and entirely created equal opportunities for everyone. While it has lifted everyone, it has also left many behind. And therefore, the question arises of uh, certainly a need to reform. But so where and how, where do we start? What's the priorities there? What do you think? Can you offer some thoughts on those? Oh, please go ahead, Ambassador. Okay. For me, I think uh, like the civil society will have an important role because they have a different perspective. Like uh, there's no, they have a more objective uh, perspective in their view of the seriousness of the problem and uh, what are the really concerns and so on. So um, there should be more room for participation uh, for the point of view of our uh, civil society. And then of course the academe and the think tank um, so that the uh, point of view, traditional point of view uh, will be uh, convinced uh, to see more uh, of the uh, challenges. No? not from the uh, institutional or from the, uh, let's say, traditional view, but look more uh, on the uh, concerns, uh, serious concerns. Well, actually, one example will be like uh, the business sector. Now we have what we call environmental social governance ESG method in the investment as a, a factor in investing. So I think uh, that's one way uh, we can see, let's say, uh, all segments of society cooperating. Uh, we cannot depend, I think, not just on the government, unfortunately. Uh, so we have to look at the other segments who may be more object objective, like the Arabian, the think tanks, and they can, uh, let's say, uh, encourage or motivate uh, new policies for the uh, government. No? So they champion the policies and then make the government follow in these changes. So uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, one of the uh, possible approaches. So more involvement of the think tank, academe, and civil society so that there will be a more, uh, let's say, uh, balanced, equitable approach in policy making and uh, norm development. Yes, okay. Maybe okay. Just a second. Maybe okay. In next 10 years, we will still debate about the UN Security Council reform. I, unless okay, there is something major thing that happened. And uh, as you talked about all these many literal institutions, it's uh, because it's so costly and nations really don't want to give the sovereignty into, you know, in those institutions. So we're still saying many like a mini literalism, but uh, some of them, because it still takes time and costly. And then even like we can talk about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it as if like a sounds and looks like a very strong uh, emerging institution, but it's still like there's a, after many, so many years, there is still problem. It's not, uh, it's we still get not so clear about the purpose and the uh, purpose and objective of the organizations. But however, we can talk about the World Health Organization or uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. So those are very critical institutions, and I don't think of uh, surviving the COVID without WHO because it provides the information, it you know, links the network, it uh, provides training, and all those things. So this really coordinates. And it is really helped Mongolia to go over the pandemic. And so I would say that the mineral literalism we will still like see around lots of initiatives. All the major institutions will still remain exist, but however, all the like a uh, European Union or the World Health Organization, those are key institutions. We will still need to overcome some of the challenges. And yes, coming back to where we started with the new technology, with climate, you know, uh, maybe those are also the 
places to build uh, maybe adjust some of the inequities uh, in the power mm. play so to say right <laughs> uh, one could one could contend <clears throat> thank you very much let's move let's look at the next question which is uh, how do economic relations between states especially for developing countries affect alliances in terms of the great power rivalry so I understand this a little bit like uh, what role does this trade and economic relations play um, play in this geopolitical uh, world? The, 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 the economic building, well, what about building of these economic dependencies in the midst of talks of decoupling, supply chain uh, re-engineering re, re and so on and so forth? What do you think? Uh, uh, should 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 there be more? Should there be less? How does it impact? Yeah, I would probably could say uh, very uh, less on this because I'm uh, not an economist, <laughs> and 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 I was I was look at we all agree that okay, this uh, great power play in the play like it really hurts the economies, especially especially the small countries, and then we can talk about like a five G. And there is a big competition occurring and it is forcing the countries to take sides on this and even like and it has some and it has their own explanation and justifications and some other technologies and so we can say like a we see there is a competition going on between the, the especially china and the united states or, or the on the technology side and if they collaborate the small states will benefit, but if they compete against, it will be hard for for the countries. And I would probably it affect the manufacturing. It uh, will affect the supply and affect all types of logistics of the of the industry. But I really know little about the economics. <laughs> I'm so sorry about this. Sorry. So uh, I think that has been like uh, traditional weapon, traditional means, uh, economic uh, like uh, sanctions or uh, like, uh, so we have, for example, the trade war or tech war between US and China. And so for US, uh, so the allies are not supposed to uh, like, uh, they have to uh, decouple from the suppliers from China. Uh, so European companies have to choose uh, on the tech uh, technology. On the other hand, China is also using it. For example, Australia uh, joined uh, states in requesting China to be more open about the COVID, origin of COVID. And then the response of China is that uh, China imposed high tariff on all the exports of Australia to China, like the wine exports, uh, uh, agricultural products. And uh, they really had high trade between China and Australia. And so with this uh, retaliation, form of retaliation through uh, higher uh, bar, tar, or tariff barrier. So uh, Australia had to diversify uh, its uh, market. No, So its states use it as part of uh, their uh, craft, uh, their tools to impose, to use uh, the uh, whatever advantage they have uh, uh, in order to uh, let's say, uh, obtain the goal that they are reaching for, all right? Uh, and anyway, so those are two examples of trading partners, but uh, of using the uh, prohibition sanctions barriers to uh, influence or affect the policy making of other countries. Anyway, so in the future, uh, what what will happen, what will be done again. Uh, and then, of course, we have now the uh, sanction against uh, Russia 
uh, on the oil, uh, other countries, uh, and so on. Um, so we can see, we can assess the uh, advantages or disadvantages of availing of economic sanctions as a tool uh, for uh, solving the gaining, attaining the objectives of countries involved. Yeah, and I think from a from a classical perspective, it's also a testing time of that democratic peace theory and uh, you know the McDonald's peace theory, as 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 others put it, was it Tom Friedman um, <clears throat> to see you know whether these uh, trade the creating the trade dependencies, uh, whether they're raising the cost of of tensions and war to the extent of it preventing or not, um, and 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 I think that's an un that's that's a theory testing time, so to say, that we live in. The next question comes back a little bit to the region specific from Shi Hui Wun. I'll try to unpack it a little bit from what I understand. Firstly, there's a question a little bit around: uh, Is there sufficient um, array of mutually uh, reinforce, reinforcing confidence building measures? and multilateral security and defense institutions. So a little bit like, is there adequate uh, or a need, or is there something in proxy of a security architecture in the region uh, to prevent uh, disputes from flaring up that involves issues around territorial disputes, uh, security issues, so on and so forth. And I think the second question is a little bit to do with how does the region uh, fight the onslaught of this authority, rise of authoritarian, authoritarianism uh, and, and, and this uh, bottom of the barrel type of economic system. Uh, both fairly big questions, <laughs> but uh, important ones. So, Maybe I'll take the, the first one. So are there like a viable like institutions? And I would uh, probably get the ASEAN could be the one we can name. Like this is probably get the one of the the functional, uh, probably get our Southeast Asian colleagues will comment on that. But uh, for me, like ASEAN at the moment is kind of one of the functional institutions which will solve the issues between the member states and adding the East Timor, you know, that was a great decision. However, in the other region, South Asia, I really don't see like if there's an institution exists there. And then Northeast Asia, this is really very realist. Uh, the, this is like a realism place uh, or, or, or land. And then in Central Asia, and it's, uh, it's hard. And then we can't even, like I say, Shanghai Cooperation Organization has a role in it. And it can provide the, it is the, the infrastructure is there, but we haven't seen like uh, the real effects of those, that institution as a confidence building mechanism. So, so I will probably say ASEAN is the one of the best example. Hopefully, okay, it will go further and become a very stronger one. And then rising after after Tronism and then Mongolia is uh, between these two, and then we always felt like uh, at the threshold, and then we seen the. So we it's a. Uh, I don't know if it's whether okay, we can call this as a rise of the authoritarianism or it's a weakening. We don't know it's, uh, whether like a, it will be seen like a, uh, whether like a, it, it's hard to say okay, whether the Russia is really becoming a very strong authoritarian state or it's there is a decay is going on. It will be clubs soon or the same thing about the Kazakhstan. And yeah, so, but for the Mongolian case, like we always say like it's, uh, or kind of the, always the crossroads. Uh, at one point, you see like, uh, our democracy is becoming very stronger, but uh, on the other hand, like you see, oh, there's there like a shrinking civil space, and then then it becoming more like a crony type of democracy. So it's a uh, hard to say. And it's in these days, it's really hard to put the classified the states like a Tartarian or it. There's no clear like. Uh, definition or, or indicators. Yes, so <laughs> the question on uh, the 
uh, effectiveness of the uh, in the Pacific uh, in the wake of the uh, hegemon. Uh, well, our, so we are aware, like for example, uh, Russia after the Cold War uh, had to like uh, reinstate its earlier prestige and its earlier um like uh dominance in the region no in uh Eurasia uh and in that area so uh that's why I was thinking uh, that is one of the reasons why uh Russia invaded Ukraine uh to get back to its former glory and it's the same uh like uh thinking let's say for China so China underwent through these centuries of humiliation when before uh, they were the uh, leading the Middle Kingdom, and then later the Western powers invaded uh, uh, during the Opium War, invaded uh, uh, China, and they had to open China, and then Hong Kong was under uh, UK, you know. And so it was like it's like this uh, history of this hegemon. Uh, seeking to reinstate itself. So, uh, what can countries do? Uh, we are now in a new era. Uh, it's now a different world. And how come that mindset uh, still prevails among the countries? How come there is no uh, development or transformation or evolution of outlook? Uh, how come now? So, it's still like the glory of the nation that is important and not the uh, welfare of the whole of humanity or mankind. So, uh, how do we, uh, let, let me say, uh, shift or change that? Now, uh, we have some, for example, uh, some countries have an outlook that is more uh, concerned about the uh, welfare of the uh, citizens, not only the uh, influential ones, but all the uh, the citizens involved. So it's like, uh, how will that spread? Uh, how will that uh, be communicated? Or how will that outlook uh, be imbibed in uh, other countries? All right. So uh, I think we saw that in uh, after World War II, when there was this, uh, let's say, the attraction to the spread of communism. And then the attraction to the spread of, uh, like the Nordic countries were uh, liberal democratic, but at the same time adopted social welfare policies. And so uh, they were able to lift up the welfare of uh, all the levels of society, you know, and they did not depend on the trickle down policy of neoliberalism. Uh, so they balanced uh, the being. Uh, 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 advance in the uh, economically competitive uh, in technology and at the same time caring for the welfare of all segments of society and does not depend on uh, that the progress and development will automatically trickle down to all levels and we have seen that that does not work also no so it's uh, uh, good to uh, also be uh, very concerned and have specific policies towards the welfare of uh, all segments of our society. Anyway, so I think uh, that's just the comparison of the models uh, that's that happened and being adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from May Ping, and uh, it's it's actually a good segue following this question. Uh, this this question related to multilateralism, but ensuring that uh, there is a really global approach in framing uh, you know, the institutions, the solutions, the policies that is put forward. Uh, and as we have just heard, a lot of there is, at this particular time, we have heard from our panelists that there is uh, more need for multilateralism than any other time. But at the same time, we also see these trends towards reverting inward and nationalism. And therefore, very often, uh, even though the big issues that contend us are global in nature, uh, very often nations are voting or choosing uh, 
uh, even when they come to the global table, uh, the national interests first. So how can we truly uh, get policymakers and those at these high tables to reconsider this and how can um, this approach to look a little bit more broadly, more, uh, more, more uh, humanita hum hum humankind in its entirety type of approach? Um, so the, it's quite a, uh, let's say more long-term, maybe it includes education of the public. So if the public, if the citizens are well-informed, educated, then let's say the decisions uh, of the uh, government uh, will be uh, more uh, towards the welfare of the people. No? So one is, because we have seen also that uh, uh, the officials that we elect may not necessarily be the appropriate ones to consider the needs of the, um, let's say, the uh, other segments. No, uh, however, uh, in the Philippines, uh, there are like uh, breakthroughs. <laughs> we have seen some uh, locally elected officials that are opposite of uh, the traditional ones that consider the. Uh, welfare and needs of the most needy segment and uh, implement transparency in governance and good governance. Uh, so uh, like for me, it's really uh, more education so that there is this glamour from the public, you know, and then, uh, and that is the pressure on the government uh, official. If there is no pressure, it will be as if, Oh, life goes on, no? So uh, we build up more educated, uh, and it can start with the young people, young, the children, and then the teenagers, and so on, with this uh, mindset of uh, demanding uh, transparency, integrity, uh, and they promise it in their personal lives, as well as demanding it from uh, the officials. <laughs> Anyway, so that's and that's also where media has a role to play. So uh, media, uh, it should be what media should be doing, educating the people and not propagating misinformation or disinformation. Okay. This is a hard one. I probably it's it's always difficult to bring them to the common goal because there are always okay, it's our domestic politics, like a parliament and even the, within the party. So they it's really hard to bring the party members to the common objective. They will rank them on their based on their needs and timing and then short termism. However, I really like uh, uh, agree with the ambassador that like uh, the role of the media and transparency is the key to it is like a shaming them or the pressure them and to have them like accountable for but it's uh, I, I we've seen in the EU, EU it's really hard to bring them to the decision on and Ukraine is really an exceptional case like to bring all the EU countries on the same point against Russia otherwise it's, it's uh, it is very difficult and this is very painful decision for many European countries but it could happen <laughs> I think yeah and, and I think uh, along with uh, with with the shrinking spaces, democratic spaces that we have received from the questions so far, I think intrinsically linked is also uh, a, a, a lineage around shrinking spaces for this media, right? Uh, and the need for independent free uh, media. Uh, so 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 that continues to be. As they say, there's no uh, dull moment in geopolitics these days. Uh, and even though we're reaching a little bit towards the end, uh, you know, the questions are just hotting up, so to say. <laughs> and uh, this this is the way it is. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll just acknowledge and reach out some of the few questions, and then I'll offer both our panelists to give some remarks. Some of them I can see are all quite interlinked, uh, <clears throat> but always important 
uh, that we bring those issues uh, if, even in discussions like this. First is regarding uh, the, the, the Ambassador Alerila's mention of civil society and private sector having prominent role, uh, you know, moving forward in our global dialogue. Uh, how important should governments consider in, uh, in incorporate concept of human security uh, as, they, as they also devise new security architectures? Uh, that's one from Vincenzo. We have from Mohammed Faisal. Can you explain US policy on, ta on Taiwan and why China is very angry about it? That's a very large question. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll have time. I think that merits uh, uh, an entire uh, topic, uh, this, this webinar on this and how this US-China provocation is affecting the Southeast Asia region. Of course, that's also at the heart of what we see, the geopolitical rivalry and everyone pushed to the uh, pushed, pushed to two sides. Uh, from Simon, we have, what would you say about China's AIIB and the One Belt, One Road initiative complement or compete against, uh, against the uh, current existing order and by that effect, we may also say, how does it uh, compete or, uh, or complement the other, many other uh, economic um, roadmap offerings, the global gateway and whatnot. Uh, <clears throat> if it competes, what are the conditions for it to be effective? And how can uh, ASEAN as a multilateral entity navigate? Uh, okay, so this is navigating great power rivalry that we have come to as well. Um, and finally, would it be in, it would be interesting to hear panelists' opinion on what would be the big, best response to China's initiate, initiatives from the respective perspective of their countries? Okay, so maybe both your country perspective. And lastly, from Roberto, what would the demand and need for multilateralism be fueled by the weaponization of currencies and trade practice by a few Western governments? So there are some very broad, uh, broad, broad overlaying topics, uh, maybe uh, something around navigating geo geo maybe, uh, the, the, the geopolitical rivalry, a little bit about, uh, so whether it is in the infrastructure projects, whether it is in, 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 in the trade practices, or whether it is in this defense and security posturing, maybe, maybe some parting thoughts before I give the floor back to Annie. You're, you're muted, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, it's like, a, this is a lot of uh, questions. It's uh, probably okay. each deserves like a special session on, on that, but uh, I would say it's uh, building infrastructure is better than the the building or, or developing the weapon systems and uh, and uh, kind of like a triggering the arms race. So I will probably guess, say okay, this is a uh, infrastructure is much needed in Asia. It will increase the connectivity, and and then the dividing up is really hard for us. Like it, it really puts the small states, uh, even the ASEAN as a whole, in a hard question whether like you you join which side. So I would rather say because okay, so we need to push more like uh, multilateralism and resolving the issues uh, together instead of like uh, fighting each other or or increasing the conspiracy explanations for for all and then i would just like i say that as a kung fu panda movie so like it's uh, the past is history <laughs> future is mystery and today's a gift right <laughs> so that's what we call uh today's a uh, present <laughs> so i'll just uh stop there and Investor. Uh, so I answered the question directed to me, uh, like the human security uh, being incorporated, let's say, in the government's plan. Uh, so uh, we know that the concept of security has expanded. So it's not only the uh, military, uh, uh, political aspect, or the government aspect. So we now have human security, uh, also societal security uh, for the um, uh, the dignity of the uh, groups, uh, ethnic groups. Now, it's the problem. I like for example, an example for the Philippines. It's incorporated in our national development plan. 
and there are specific steps to accomplish it. But uh, so, uh, is it being implemented, and how uh, effective it is? Let's say if you're going to rate the effectiveness of the implementation of the action plans, what would be the rating? Ten out of I mean three out of ten, four out of ten uh, for the action plan. So that's the challenge now. It's the implementation. It's in the it's part of the development plan, but the implementation, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, what's the status? We can see the same thing for the sustainable development goals of the UN, which also address these issues. So uh, what will be the uh, degree of uh, attainment or accomplishment? And in ASEAN, you have the work plans, uh, our also the plan of action, and we also do the assessment for each. And that's the challenge again. Uh, it's the implementation. And uh, so uh, what's the alternative if the goal is not reached? Or let's say if the country is not implementing it. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the like a uh, serious question. So again, uh, it goes back to, let's say, the uh, awareness and the passion of the citizens. If the citizens are committed, there is strong pressure on the government. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to awaken our citizens. Uh, it, it will come from them because otherwise everyone is relaxed. Mm -hmm. Just the same situation. Thank you. Well, we, we do have to bring this to a close, but, uh, but, but, and even though there is so much more uh, we could go on, uh, but but we'll 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 close it at this. I, I will offer three of not uh, three three of my favorite takeaways. <laughs> is that one is we have to really connect uh, the 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 local the issues of equities of justice of strengthening uh, institutions democracy. Uh, in able in 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 countries being able to navigate and eventually uh, globally together as well, uh, the headwinds of all these geopolitical pressures. Uh, that's obviously something that's come out very strongly. Secondly, is that the lessons from history is that you must ensure that there's an equitable treatment of both winners and losers, that the humiliation of the losers may not always produce very good uh, long lasting peace. And by that extrapolation, if we take a futures thinking is to understand that uh, in the geopolitics, there are no permanent friends or enemies, and therefore the need to not uh, over vilify enemies, neither glorify the friends. Right. With that, uh, I would like to thank uh, Annie, the Lee Kuan Yew School, uh, the, the, the Futures team uh, for organizing this uh, event. But before that, a very, very big, big, uh, big hand, uh, uh, an online hand to our two panelists who have provoked so much questions, thoughts, and you can see from the comments that we have had, uh, and also very much to the audience for bringing in so much of your, uh, of your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dun Kim, and really thank you to the two panelists for the insightful mm -hmm. conversation. I think, you know, as usual, we have more questions than time. So apologize to those who had those questions, but we, you know, we didn't have time to answer all of those questions in details. But I really appreciate, you know, the time taken by the panelists as well as the um, audience. I think for me, uh, my key takeaway, you know, as with uh, as usual, you know, as when we talk about the future of certain topic, I think <clears throat> that the, the point is really not to try to kind of predict, you know, what will happen in the future, but uh, it's more of kind of, you know, uh, anticipating some of the drivers of change, learning from the past, and then also kind of then uh, uh, prioritize, you know, what are some of the things that we can do now to kind of shape and influence that futures. And to that, I really like you know, the point that was discussed a lot today in terms of the role of non-state actors, right? Uh, roles of um, civic society uh, to have that more dialogue. And I think with that in mind that, you know, we hosted this kind of conversations uh, to kind of, you know, help address some of the current key issues that we have. 
and also around the role of non-state actors. I have one question to the panelists and audience. Uh, you know, in the role of, you know, event like FIFA World Cup in addressing some of the geopolitical tensions, you know, is a soccer game, you know, effective to alleviate and kind of get people forget a bit on some of the tensions? And if so, I wonder if we can do FIFA World Cup every year. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of soccer fans will be happy to hear that. Um, um, and with that, um, if we can have the slides, some of the closing slides uh, back on the screen. Um, and if you could bear just a few more minutes with us, um, you know, uh, there's a QR code on the screen. So if you could help me, um, uh, help us uh, scan the QR code and then spend a few seconds to fill up that form. Uh, maybe let's give five seconds uh, for everyone. Uh, let's go to the next slides, please. And of course, uh, today is the last episode of the Futures Forward webinar for this year. But don't uh, 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 fret not because uh, we will <coughs> have a, a, a sort of celebration at the end. Uh, Sort of ultimate uh, community engagement event that we are going to have. So we will have a futures community conference uh, that uh, will happen on the 9th of December. So um, in that event, we will have uh, a very prominent futures, uh, you know, futures practitioners who will share about some of the interesting projects uh, that you know they did this year and uh, around um, also various topics. I believe geopolitics will also be one of the topics. So uh, if you are interested to hear more or some more insights on the future of geopolitics, please you know, sign up and we look forward to having um, some of you joining the um, event. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And also as usual here at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy Executive Education, we do have some of the um, upcoming executive programs. Uh, one of it will be specifically on the futures, which is the Futures Masterclass, Foresight the Policy. It is an online program, and we are offering early bird promotion from now until 28th of February, 2023. Um, next slide, please. And of course, you know, if you would like to collaborate with us on uh, futures or otherwise, whether it is executive education, or any other uh, futures topic and uh, projects, do contact us. And I think that will be my last slide. Once again, uh, please join us in um, thanking uh, Dean Kim, uh, Dr. Mandy, as well as Ambassador Marilyn for uh, joining us today you know, and sharing the wonderful insights. Uh, I wish everybody a good evening, good morning. And I'm really sorry, you know, Dr. Mandy, it's close to like 2.34 now in Vancouver. I hope, uh, you know, you will have a very good morning sleep. And uh, for all soccer fans in the world, I, I hope to see another surprise. Uh, you know, we, we saw Saudi Arabia uh, beating Argentina yesterday. I wonder if Japan will do the same wonder uh, against Germany uh, this evening in Singapore time. Uh, with that, I will see everyone on the 9th of December, if not the uh, future run of a forward, a Futures Forward uh, webinar next year. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>